Bonjour tout le monde. Hello, everyone. Je suis extrêmement heureux de vous accueillir aujourd'hui pour la conférence annuelle du projet Equality. I am delighted to welcome you today for the Equality Annual Lecture, a virtual event um, hosted by the University of Ottawa A and Society Initiative in collaboration with the University of Ottawa Centre for Law, Technology and Society and the Shirk Partnership Autonomy Through Cyber Justice Technologies. For those who don't know me, uh, my name is Florian Martin Barreto. I am the director of the AN Society Initiative. Uh, I am an associate professor and the University of Ottawa Research Chair in Technology and Society, as well as the director of the University Center for Law, Technology and Society. Uh, this year, uh, Equality uh, Annual Lecture wanted to amplify the conversation around algorithmic bias and notably discrim discriminatory practices against Black, Indigenous, and people of color. And um, we had the pleasure to propose uh, a virtual screening of that amazing documentary titled Coded Bias in the Past Days. And uh, today uh, we are delighted to welcome you for a virtual conversation with uh, the director of Coded Bias, Shalini Kentaya. I will remind you so that event is, is recorded. I will kindly ask everybody to switch off the, the video uh, of your camera so you can just see uh, our panelists. And please ask the question in the, in the chat. You will see it's the bubble uh, at the top of your screen. So ask all your questions there and then we will um, ask them to uh, our uh, panelists. And without further ado, I will hand it over to my dear colleague, Professor Jane Bailey, the co-lead of the Equality Project, who will present our panelists. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Florian, and welcome everyone to this um, exceptional um, event. Um, I have the uh, pleasure as uh, one of the co-leaders of the Equality Project, uh, together with uh, Valerie Steves uh, from the Department of Criminology, um, to welcome um, our two uh, speakers today, uh, the Director of Coded Bias, uh, Shalini Kantaya, who is a TED Fellow, uh, William Fulbright Scholar, and a finalist for the ABC Disney DGA Directing Program. She is an associate at UC Berkeley Graduate School of Journalism and her feature documentary, Coded Bias, which all of you will have looked at for today, premiered at the 2020 Sundance Film Festival. She also directed an episode of the National Geographic television series, Breakthrough, um, executive produced by Ron Howard and broadcast globally in 2017. Her debut feature film, Catching the Sun, premiered at the LA Film Festival and was named a New York Times Critics Pick. Catching the Sun released globally on Netflix on Earth Day 2016 with executive producer Leonardo DiCaprio and was nominated for the Environmental Media Association Award for Best Documentary. And so I'm very exceptionally pleased and, and grateful to, to have uh, Ms. Cantaya with us today. Um, interviewing Ms. Kantaya is another person who I'm exceptionally pleased to have with us today, uh, Sava Sahali Singh, um, who is the um, Equality Scotiabank Postdoctoral Fellow in AI and Surveillance here at the University of Ottawa, um, which is part of the uh, AI and Society Initiative. Um, with the Equality Project, Sava is working on a research project that examines how teachers use learning technologies in their practice and how this has been impacted by COVID-19. Um, as a fellow of AI and Society, she will produce a short near future fiction film focused on the issues around the use of AI and algorithmic decision making in the context of educational technology. The film will be a fourth in her award-winning screening surveillance series, um, a public education and knowledge translation project that calls attention to the potential human consequences of big data surveillance, which as you'll see, eminently um, qualifies her um, to, to be the person who will be conducting the, the interview um, today on, the, on this um, amazing um, new film, Coded Bias. Um, 
Sava, the films that I just mentioned from Sava were co-produced um, by, by her as a postdoctoral fellow of the Surveillance Studies Centre at Queen's University in Kingston. And so with that, I will turn it over to, to uh, Sava and uh, Shalini, and, uh, and I, I'm sure everyone joins me in, in warmly welcoming our two um, very uh, prestigious uh, filmmakers, speakers, um, creative um, beings. So thank you very much. Thank you to Jane and Foyan for those introductions and for welcoming us. I am extremely excited to speak with Shalini um, about this amazing and important film, Coded Bias, that I hope everyone here has seen or will be. And if you haven't, you'll be encouraged to watch it after our conversation and you hear from Shalini and her amazing work. Um, so just to start us off, um, Shalini, as Jane mentioned, um, your first feature film was um, Catching the Sun. And I was curious, a lot of your earlier work focuses, focuses on climate change um, and issues around that. So what attracted you to the issues around facial recognition? How did you find out about this issue and what made you decide to make this film? Uh, well, first of all, I just want to thank you for, for having the film. It's such an honor to be with you today and um, for that incredible introduction. And also that you buried the lead. I didn't realize I was speaking to a fellow science fiction uh, filmmaker, and I'm, I'm delighted to be in conversation with you. Um, you know, my work always, you know, whether talking about solutions to climate change or AI, I think I'm sort of a science fiction fanatic and love technology. And a lot of my work has to do with um, a fascination with disruptive technologies and whether they make the world more fair or less fair, whether they provide more opportunity or less opportunity and for whom. And so with Catching the Sun, I was really looking at the possibility of small-scale residential solar being a vehicle to uplift um, economically workers all across the U.S. who've been um, left behind in the sort of industries of the 20th, the gray polluting industries of the 20th century, and the possibility of sort of um, the economic potential of building a new economy based on, on, on clean energy. And um, so that was sort of a utopian <laughs> ideal of the future. And with, with Coded Bias, I sort of stumbled down the rabbit hole um, with looking at big tech. And I read a book called Weapons of Math Destruction by Kathy O'Neill and Algorithms of Oppression by Cynthia Mojanoble and, and saw a TED Talk that Joy Bellamini did. And I sort of stumbled down the rabbit hole. I, I actually, three years ago, did not know what an algorithm was. I um, Everything that I knew about artificial intelligence was sort of from the imagination of Steven Spielberg or Stanley Kubrick. And, um, and so I didn't realize the way in which algorithms, machine learning, um, AI is already um, already has become a kind of automated decision maker, a gatekeeper of opportunity, um, already making decisions as important as who gets hired, who gets what quality of health care, uh, increasingly who gets the vaccine, um, who gets undue police scrutiny, how long a prison sentence someone serves, uh, what information we see. And what I began to realize um, through the, the groundbreaking work of Joy Bellamini and Kathy O'Neill and Tim Gebru and so many others in the film is that these very technologies you know, that, that, that we're trusting implicitly, we're outsourcing our decision-making to machines, our human decision-making um, around things that govern human destiny. And these machines um, have not been vetted for racial bias or for gender bias, or uh, that they'll not have unintended harms or consequences. Uh, in most cases, they haven't been vetted for some sort of shared standard of accuracy outside of the one that the company who seeks to benefit economically espouses. And that's sort of like when I began to realize um, that everything that we love 
as people of a democracy is going to be changed by AI. Um, access to information, um, fair housing, equal opportunity, um, fair criminal justice systems, um, it, everything is being rapidly transformed by AI. And my fear is one that Joy articulates so clearly in the film is that we could roll back 50 years of civil rights advances in the name of, of machine neutrality. And that's sort of kind of the journey uh, to make the film. Wow, yeah. And, and I think it's important to kind of highlight these issues. And I think that film is a really, really powerful way to do that. Um, I was, as Jane was saying, I was um, given the opportunity to kind of do that in an academic setting. Um, without realizing that I was going to do that. Um, but I honestly, like people respond to film really well. And I think the kind of narrative and storytelling you can do through film, you can't always do through other forms, right? Um, so speaking of, you know, some of these things that you mentioned, I'm conflicted about some of the issues this film brings up, to be honest. Um, do we want these technologies to be able to identify us better? How do we ensure that those of us who are in marginalized communities are, aren't further marginalized by this sort of technology? And I think you deal with some of these issues um, in the film, but say a little bit more about what you think about it. No, I think it's a great question. I've had, I speak to black folks who are like, maybe we don't want them to see us. <laughs> maybe this is a good thing. And, um, and I think Joy pointed out in the film that, that the question of bias is only half, half the question. I think when I speak to um, technologists and sort of techies and people who work at, at, at these companies, there's sort of this impetus to be like, we just need the perfect algorithm. It's just bad data. And, and as soon as we fix the data and get perfect data, we're gonna have the perfect algorithm that's gonna solve everything. And I think the film itself, I think, is asking for a reframe of the entire question, which is how do we build a more human-centered society and use technology in service of that? And I think that um, what I worry about is even aside from the problem of bias, which I, I just wanna mention that what is so startling about Joy's um, research on racial bias is that these were not technologies that were sitting on a shelf somewhere. This is not in a laboratory being beta tested at MIT. This is um, already being sold to the FBI at the time that she makes this realization, already being sold to ICE or immigration um, officials in the States and already uh, being sold in secret and used in secret by law enforcement all across the US. So you can see why bias is such an issue. And you saw when those three companies, I, I saw sea change that I never thought possible in the making of the film because IBM, Microsoft, and Amazon changed their policies towards selling, towards law enforcement. And that happened because it was actually engaged citizens who took the research and started to draw the connection between ra racially biased invasive surveillance technology in the hands of law enforcement and the inherent value of black life and communities that are over brutalized by um, law enforcement. And so um, I think that bias is half the issue, particularly when you have and, and communities of color and black communities are um, most vulnerable to those impacts of bias. There's no question about that. But, um, but separate from bias, if we solved bias, then we'd have perfect invasive surveillance. <laughs> and one thing that we have not looked at is that Google and Facebook have the kind of personal information, the kind of data about us that can create complete psychological profiles of us. I didn't understand the extent to how this data can be used to predict our behavior, uh, predict such uh, things as our sexuality per se, like that intimate. And they have the kind of data that makes uh, the East German Stasi look like they had a light touch. Uh, like the secret programs of COINTELPRO by our FBI in the U.S. were cute. <laughs> like that's the kind of data. And we've not, as democracies, 
began to begun to examine what it means that we are so quickly picking up the tools of authoritarian states and with no regulation. And so the question to me is also in terms of good uses and bad uses, and I'm not saying there are no good uses at all. I'm saying who gets to decide? And it's my belief that um, it should involve people of a democracy. And that is someone we elected should have some oversight of how these technologies are governed in society. And right now we have a world, like if you look at like how automobiles, like they were lawless for a while. We just got seatbelt laws like not that long ago, right? Um, you don't uh, go to a pharmacy and have a, a something that is so powerful without a label, without some guidelines in place of how this can be used and what are, it's abuse guidelines and what's the correct way to use this data set or this technology. And so my questions are really about not whether there's a good issue, a good use or a bad issue. I think it's all complicated, but there's got to be some guardrails in place that, that protect citizens um, from abuse. You're muted. I don't know that I did that. Sorry, I was saying, yeah, um, it's it's interesting, right? Trying to find a way to kind of um, control some of the ways in which this can get out get get out of hand and and in, be invasive to the point of just being oppressive to populations. Um, while making this film, what what scared you? Like, what is it you found out that really scared you about all of this? Well, I will say that, like, there was just such a learning gap for me. Like, I couldn't talk to people at parties for two years. Like, it was so hard to explain what I was working on. I think the working title was Racist Robots. And from someone who was coming outside and trying to explain, it was just, that was the biggest obstacle, I think, is trying to communicate what this is as an outsider of you know sort of what artificial intelligence is in a in a real world context you know how it's being used how it's consolidating power in the hands of the few by the powerful um how all the power is on one side because all the knowledge is on one side so i think that 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 was it was just a challenging part it's like the first time someone tried to communicate uh, climate change and Al Gore's movie Inconvenient Truth. It was just a challenging feat to try to communicate the science in a way that had integrity um, for the data scientists and mathematicians, but also was understandable to your grandmother and your uh, 10 year old uh, daughter or son. And um, I think that was what was challenging. And I think also just trying to put all the pieces together of the global picture, because I think in some ways it would have been so much easier to make a film about facial recognition, because those algorithms are sort of, it's so much easier to understand why it's personal and it's intimate and it's a unique um, print that's identifiable to you, right? That's, it's that personal. But our data is that personal to us on the web and is identifiable and, and traceable and linkable to us as a person also. And so I think it was also um, just trying to show this world and trying to show it cinematically. And the other thing is um, in film, and I think that I agree with you, I make films because I believe film is the way to change the world. And, and, and that is because people don't just think, they feel. And it's my real belief that um, uh, Bertolt Brecht says, uh, we do not act not because we do not know. We do not act what lies beyond the prison gate, the factory wall. We do not act because we do not feel. And um, and uh, Roger Ebert called uh, movies empathy machines. And um, it's my belief that that's what, and it's my argument that that's what actually human intelligence, the value of human, <laughs> that, that, that our, our power to have empathy is part of what makes us intelligent beings. And um, it, it, it's my and so my goal with the film was to connect people um, to what's at stake uh, for people 
uh, outside of the data science and mathematicians world, the real life stakes of the people who are impacted and to bring some heart to these stories. And, and that was um, what I what was challenging. You're absolutely right. And I think, you know, like you said, I think film is a really great way to reach people and have these conversations. And through that, getting people to feel and connect with the people that are in that film. And I think your film does an amazing job of kind of explaining that. Like you were talking about how it was challenging to explain to people what you were working on, because it is a complex system, right? Um, systems, rather, that are all kind of talking to each other and creating these pictures of us in a particular way. And I think um, much like, you know, Al Gore's film, your film does that, which is like, here's a really complicated thing that's really hard to talk about, but I'm going to show it to you and, you know, introduce you to people who are working to mitigate some of these harms, but also the people who have been harmed by this and what their experience has been. So I really appreciate that the stories that you kind of, touched upon and highlighted in the film. Um, for example, like the stories of the teachers being unfairly analyzed and targeted by AI was chilling, it really was. Um, it makes me think of how teachers and students are dealing with so much right now during the pandemic, right? Um, and, the, and, and so many conversations around the incredibly invasive proctoring software that many universities are forcing upon their students right now. So what impact do you think the context of the current pandemic has on the issues that you tackle in Coded Bias? Oh, such a good question. It's consolidated power. I mean, Jeff Bezos is on, on track to be the world's first trillionaire, which I personally think should be illegal. <laughs> that should be allowed. <laughs> yeah, um, but but it, it's really consolidated power. You have Mark Zuckerberg and Facebook outlawing the news on throwing news sources, credible sources of news from Australia. What is going to happen to that democracy when people are increasingly getting their news source? And that it's decisions like this that make me think of Facebook as an anti-democratic institution. It has perpetually made decisions that are anti-democratic, like I'm sorry, what I do is part journalistic and I have great respect for journalism. And um, and we see that with science, uh, with COVID and climate change and, and ethics and AI, we have complex issues to solve and they require science and they require a shared notion of reality. <laughs> a sh we need a shared set of facts <laughs> about what the world is and what science is. And you see that with the pandemic, um, how misinformation is a danger. And you see now that tech companies, they we have this law in the books from before the advent of the internet that technology companies are not responsible for what's posted on their platforms. And I think that shouldn't be allowed when they're the basis of so much of our information. When Facebook throws off literally every credible source of news in Australia <laughs> from its platform, it's quite, I mean, I, I couldn't believe it. And if it happened here, I would hope we would boycott in mass because it, it, it seems like such a extreme step. Mm -hmm. um, and so I am alarmed because what has become clear is that we can't opt out of these systems. Um, that this is the only way we can be together. Maybe we can choose blue jeans over Zoom or Microsoft Teams. <laughs> we have a, a small amount of consumer choice there, but we have to have some basic rights. Uh, it shouldn't be that it's totally in those, our civil rights are in those terms of conditions. Like we, we should have some basic rights by way of uh, being of people who live in democracies. <laughs> For sure. Um, I think, you know, earlier when you had said about democratically electing someone and having things put in place, protections put in place, um, and I apologize for asking this question in advance, what happens when you elect someone like, for instance, Donald Trump? Like, how do you kind of, you know, even in that setting, taking at face value that he was democratically elected, like what what can we do in order to prevent that sort of power from using this against um, marginalized communities? And well, they did. If you look at the 2016 election and the Cambridge Analytica scandal, mm. um, 
what they did was create psychological profiles of the 100,000 people that were likely to swing vote uh, by name um, using a nefarious questionnaire and scraping their data and not just it would give you permission, not just for your data, but your friend's data. So you could get swept into it. I got a notion someone was playing that interview game and my data got swept up into the Cambridge Analytica scandal, uh, uh, that sort of dump. And so what you had was a company that then had all of our data, this information leak that Facebook calls it, uh, is in a third party data source. They created psychological profiles of 100,000 voters that could swing the election, basically, by name, and marketed to them, um, uh, just pushing misinformation and targeted ads and sometimes things that you can't even tell are political ads. And also, Facebook has not made a commitment to um, vetting political ads to, to fact-checking. Um, they've, they've, you know, whatever Donald Trump and him had that secret meeting that no one knows about what happened there, but, um, but th they did not vet our ads. And if you look at that, that's a danger to, to democracy, like not being able to vet political ads for the truth. Uh, and we were up in arms about it because it was a uh, third party leaked information. But what Cambridge Analytica did as a scandal is Facebook's business model every day of the week and twice on Sunday. <laughs> exactly what it was supposed to, that was, that's exactly what it's designed to do. And that study that I cite um, in the film is an example of how, um, you know, our political speech also is, is interesting on Facebook because sometimes it can be shown to us in a way that where we can't even tell it's political ad or political, it's not overtly and it's just being showed to us. And you had how small manipulations in that nature study that I cite in Coded Bias, where one, people, uh, one group of people saw, Facebook tested this and published the results. And you had one group that was targeted with a small, you know, a small, almost imperceptible change of just seeing their friends' faces and I voted and those who did not see their friends' faces, they just saw I voted and they, they turned out literally enough voters to swing an election. And we know that Facebook can discern what political party we were likely to vote for. And so there are all of these um, nuances around our, as our public square moves from our auditoriums and what I call the sacred space of the independent cinema, um, sort of our, as our public conversations move from those spaces to these, um, we, we, we have a whole new set of, of issues that we haven't begun to tackle. Definitely, um, and I think, I think the um, the film The Great Hack does a really good job of kind of talking about the whole Cambridge Analytica scandal um, in an interesting way. And I think, you know, for viewers, that would be a good kind of companion piece to this, I think, because they speak, both the films speak to each other really well. Um, we now, we have like entire generations now who have grown up in this ubiquitous digital world. Mm -hmm. um, and increasingly, this is a world of algorithmic governance, right? Um, so for many children growing up in a time where like face ID or what stuff like that is there uh, where their identity is connected to authentication, this governance is unproblematic and incredibly mundane to them in some ways. Um, like they take it for granted, right? This is the way stuff works. Can you speak a little to the impacts of this sort of stuff on young people today and moving forward? Yeah, I mean, Social Dilemma also, uh, the, that yeah. film also speaks to the, this sort of ubiquitousness. Well, I think that part of the issue is that we don't have any literacy. Um, people start using this when they're 10 years old. They should learn basic literacy around data and algorithms and AI and how they work the moment they begin using the phone or begin using the internet. And I think that that's part of by design that we're not taught to um, 
empower ourselves with some basic language and literacy around uh, what we're seeing. I, I mean, I used to be an advocate of media liter literacy, knowing what you're seeing, being able to read images, being able to understand subtext of what's being said and the, the undertone of the politics of what's being said. That same kind of literacy sort of has to happen in these black box algorithms and people have to start to question them. And I think the other thing is just, we haven't looked, and I think is, I think Kathy O'Neill calls it algorithmic obedience training. And I just <laughs> love this term so much because it's, it really is how our society is being reworked around. I mean, how many times, including me, have we posted and said like, oh my God, no one's liking it. It must be like, this isn't, we're remaking our behavior um, by which what is popular is good and what is popular is not always good. Um, uh, um, you know, anyway, uh, Kardashians <laughs> come to mind, uh, but you know, but, but what is popular is not good. I mean, 10% of the population follows her. <laughs> and so um, here in the States. And so I think that um, we haven't yet looked at how this is also just even reshaping our neurology. I mean, I, I cut down on Facebook when I learned that it was making us less happy. And we're seeing a generation of people whose entire societal upbringing is being um, formed by this. And to me, the only way to sort of take a hack at that is to give people critical literacy, is to empower people with critical literacy, to give them tools to understand the systems that they interact with, to question them, and to empower themselves to make uh, different choices around um, their interaction with it. I think literacy is definitely um, a thing that we need to kind of focus on in terms of getting people to understand how these systems work. Like it, they're so opaque to us in so many ways, right? And I think your film, it, you know, in my work, I try to do that, which is like, you know, show people, give them a hint of what's happening behind. Like, I don't think the people who use algorithms necessarily understand how they work. So there's like literacy at different levels that is necessary, but to um, understand how something works and the effect it's having on us in that way. Um, so I have friends, you know, speaking of, I have friends who understand this stuff, who are critical of this sort of technology, but they still use it. I'm looking at all you friends who use Alexa mm -hmm. in your homes. <laughs> um, do you think this issue can be addressed through individual choice in that way? Or does it need collective action and systemic approaches? What can we do to mobilize people, even people who understand some of this stuff? I mean, I understand it and you understand it. I'm still, I'm on Twitter. I have my phone, all these things. Like we still do this stuff. Like, so what, what can we do to mobilize people to really make those changes? And, and I think you're right. Opting out is not an option at this point. Like it, it just isn't. And so I don't think that individual action is the thing. I think we need to flex collectively. And the good news is, is that in spite of um, Coded Bias being a terrifying film, as I'm told, um, I think it's also a very hopeful film in, in the sense that I think I make documentaries because it reminds me that everyday people can make a difference. And I've seen that in, in the making of this film, how a few people acting collectively like Big Brother Watch in the UK, where you have essentially three young people rolling back um, real time facial recognition by the London police single handedly um, really and, and I've seen stories like that. And so if you go to the codedbias.com website, there's a take action page and there are many amazing organizations. I probably should put some more Canadian ones on there, um, <laughs> but, the, but there's amazing ones like th that might be also able to connect you to local actions. Um, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, the ACLU, um, Algorithmic Justice League, um, Mi Gente, um, and so many others. And to me, um, we can support these organizations that are pushing for systematic changes, uh, that are pushing for legislative change. And I also just want to say that um, we have a lot of power acting locally and acting as Canada. <laughs> and, and I'll just say that because We've seen here in the States that the first 
um, municipalities who, who banned facial recognition at the local level have been these technological hubs, the places that understand how they work. So Oakland, San Francisco, uh, Cambridge, Somerville have all banned facial recognition by law enforcement. I think Vermont was the first state. Um, we almost had data protection and memorandum pass in ca California. Um, Illinois has a slightly different, uh, more strict data regimen than the rest of the country. And I'm saying that because I believe these actions really matter and that when we pass local policy, we disrupt the strong, ubiquitous stronghold that big tech has on the world. And so whenever we disrupt this power, uh, we make it more inconvenient for big tech <laughs> to just do what they want because they don't want to have one set of policy for Illinois and the rest or for California and the, and the other 49 get another state. Similarly, um, as Americans, we got some protections uh, under the European GDPR, uh, citizens that um, had our data because our data transited Europe we got um, European data rights protections. Similarly, if Canada were to pass um, stronger data protections as a, as a you know, our, our more ethical neighbors to the North, um, <laughs> the, that um, it would make it incredibly inconvenient for them, um, <laughs> for big tech to have a stronghold on North America. And they would not want to do one set of policies for Canada and one set of policies um, for the U.S. And so to me, that is sort of the, the strategy is sort of supporting local organizations that are that are making systematic change and really pushing for change at the local level, starting with your university, starting with being aware uh, when your university introduces technologies that you think are invasive or maybe in violation of students' rights, ca causing public dialogue, having civil di dialogue um, in, in, uh, with technologists and policymakers and students and people that are impacted. I think those kinds of local decisions really matter. Definitely. And I think, um, you know, there are things in place and I think there are community move, uh, groups that are pushing for some of this stuff. And I, I, I hope people on this call that are involved in the levels in Canada of trying to do data protection stuff is, are listening to you. Because um, <laughs> that's, that's an interesting way to do it. Like, you know, pointing to other countries and forcing America to do something because other people are doing it, right? That's, that's an interesting kind of... Um, so I'm going to ask you um, a slightly controversial question, I think. Um, what do you think about the upheaval that's currently taking place in the broader AI research community in terms of Google's questionable actions against the leadership of their own ethical AI team? Uh, Timnit Gebru, who you feature in your uh, film, and more recently, Margaret Mitchell as well. I'm always conflicted about so many of my extremely smart and critical colleagues and friends working for the big tech firms in Silicon Valley, ostensibly to affect change from within. But if I were being honest, I'm not surprised by Google's behavior while also feeling extremely sad that these people are being penalized for trying to do the right thing, to do things ethically and, you know, in a weird way, do things that are actually good for Google to be doing, right? Um, how do you feel about what's happening right now? Um, no, I thank you for the question. I think one, um, Google can't afford to lose um, uh, someone of the caliber uh, and one of the few black women in um, ethical AI at Google. Um, that's genius in the room that, um, quite frankly, they can't afford to lose. Um, and I, I, I want to say that I see a pattern um, with companies that uh, often in this happened to joy also with Amazon, um, seek to dismiss and attack the research of independent scientists uh, that sh are shining a light on AI and around these technologies. And I have seen that as a pattern. And I think that this has sent a chilling effect through the industry. 
uh, around what exactly is their commitment to ethical AI. And I think points a finger to the fact that we can't count on these companies to self-regulate. Um, I mean, my hat is off to IBM, I have to say, because they got out of the facial recognition game and essentially uh, changed their business model, disrupted their own business model. I think it's extraordinarily rare. That's a unicorn <laughs> that, 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 some, that, that a company would take that level of step. And I, I want to applaud that company for doing that. But um, I think more often we're seeing this pattern, which is first independent science gets attacked in the name of those who, who, who stand to benefit economically. And it's only when there's a groundswell of support. Um, I think it's notable that um, the three largest tech companies didn't change their um, policy on facial recognition when the research came out. They um, changed their policy when the largest movement for civil rights and equality happened in 50 years in June for 2020, when people were taking the streets um, uh, against the unjust murder of George Floyd. And that's when they took that action. And so it just points to the fact that independent science is only part of it, but engaged citizens, engaged people of a democracy is what we need to actually push them to make change. And this also just points to a flaw that as long as it's up to big tech uh, to make these decisions um, by themselves of their own volition, and they can pick up and put down invasive surveillance tools or tools that may or may not be racially biased as they see fit, our democracy is in trouble. And um, we, I think what this firing points to is that we need uh, bigger strongholds that are going to hold these companies accountable from the outside. For sure. Thank you so much for um, your thoughtful answers to all of my questions. I, I'm keeping an eye on the time and I want to leave time for audience questions as well. So I'm going to pick up a couple of those that my um, colleague Robert has been collecting for me in a document on the side. <laughs> um, so uh, one of the audience members says, uh, thank you for the important film. I was surprised by the note that there is no federal regulation of algorithms. What would that look like for you? We have regulation of algorithms in some contexts, including their use in healthcare. Um, do you want a general law on all algorithms? How can it be distinguished from regulating math? That's an interesting way to think about it. That's interesting. Well, I, I think that um, this would be up to a great, I hope there would be a lot of people at the table to answer this question. Um, and I think that what I see is something what Kathy O'Neill talks about in the film, which is sort of an FDA for algorithms, that there would be some sort of review process for all algorithms, whether it be self-driving cars or facial recognition or, or other technologies, even apps, I, I yes, I would yes, I would subject all of them to some sort of scrutiny of process um, where they have to sit through scrutiny by experts, and and those would be people like Joy and Kathy, who are who have the expertise to sort of vet will this cause unintended harm. Uh, what are the warning labels on this? Is it safe? Is it discriminatory? Um, could someone, could a third party actor use it for nefarious purposes? Um, what happens to the data? What, what is happening now is it goes right from big tech to our streets. And then when it's trouble, we roll it back after it's been deployed at scale. And, and that seems like a backwards way to, to roll out technology. It feels like there needs to be. And again, I think we're at a point where, you know, I, I believe in an FDA, that doesn't mean I don't like food. I love food. I, I just think there should be a quality of health and safety uh, for everyone and a vetting process that, that certain standards that we hold everyone to. And, I'm a, and I really think there should be a label on stuff on data sets and on algorithms of how it should be used. You have people at police departments um, uh, putting in pictures of Woody Harrelson because someone thought it was uh, Woody Harrelson. That that teacher algorithm that uh, Mr. Santos was um, 
subject to was created to um, judge fertility in bulls. It's being used to grade teachers. I'm not joking. I'm not making this stuff up. And so um, there, there's a way in which that sometimes this stuff can get oversold and abused. Like it's a black box. Like a judge sees Latanya Myers uh, risk assessment, not knowing how it arrived at that risk assessment and, and, and doesn't know how to weight it in the rest of her criminality. We're just giving too much power to these algorithms. And so it would look something like an FDA. Um, uh, we would have regulations like we do for cars and for other things, you know, seatbelts. Yeah, <laughs> that sounds doable. Yes. Um, there was another question, I think, which was part of a longer question, but you answered part of it in our conversation. Um, but I think I'll, I'll try and read the whole one. But it's the last part so that there's a little bit of context. Um, how can document films like Coded Bias intersect with digital literacy, which is the part you talked about, um, as well as effective citizen ad advocacy concerning the appropriate design and use of uh, facial recognition technology? Um, and I think you answered a bunch of that, but I, the, the audience member wanted to know what has been inspiring or disappointing from Coded Bias in terms of the nexus of these two. Well, I, w I will say that I've realized that the importance of inclusion and when I when I talked about Dr. Timna Gebru, her genius was missing from the room. I actually mean her genius was missing from the room and it's Google's loss. Like that is a real thing. This technology is being built by an elite homogeneous um, group of makers who often don't have knowledge about the world. And I think that part of it is a pipeline issue. So I think that one of the things that I've realized in the making of this film is this compassion for human beings because we all have bias. It's not like just in some bad people, it's like an innate human condition regardless of race, gender, class, religious um, affiliation, sexual orientation, any of that, we all have bias. And so it, it, it means that we all have to control for that bias. And so what that means is that inclusion is not just something that's good for the pictures, but that in order to thrive and build competitive technologies in the industries of the future, that we actually need radical inclusion. We need inclusion um, and diversity that reflects the world that we live in because we're designing for the world that we live in. And I think the other thing that needs to happen is not just diversity um, sort of, you know, in the companies, but also, you know, bringing in outside ethicists, policymakers, civil society, and not just techies. I think that techies are making too many decisions on their own. And I think part of that is also diversifying the curriculum for how AI is taught. And you see a new generation of mathematicians and data scientists who say, um, we need a women's studies course, we need an ethics course, and we need a black studies course as part of our computer science uh, training because we can't design for society if we don't know anything about society. And I think that the, that kind of um, interdisciplinary, inclusive approach is, is is part of how we solve the problem. Thank you, yeah. Um, there is a comment from um, an audience member and I wanna share it because I think it's relevant and significant to what we were talking about in terms of literacy. Um, they say that I'm a research and evaluation associated, associate at Media Smarts um, and we've just completed a qualitative research project on algorithms, AI, and privacy with youth. The need and desire for more algorithmic literacy was strongly expressed by participants to age 13 to 17. So there's, I'm, I'm bringing that up. Um, thank you for that comment, by the way, because I think that kind of shows us that there is a need and a desire for people to understand these systems that are affecting their lives so significantly. So it's heartening to know that, you know, a lot of times people say that, oh, kids don't care about their privacy. And, I have found the opposite. Young people are engaged, are interested, are curious, are worried. You know, they want a better and more equitable future for themselves and their, and you know, their families and their friends. Um, so, related to that, I mean, 
the films that I created were in an academic setting. We created them as educational resources. So they're available online for free and people have been showing them in classes. And like my favorite thing to do is to talk to students about these issues. And they always have really great questions and really great reactions and thoughts about these things. Um, can you say a little bit about the impact that your film has had, that Coded Bias has had? Yes, I'm kind of amazed by it myself. <laughs> <laughs> I'm amazed by it. I I um I think what has been amazing to me is that the film has made an impact outside of tech, but also increasingly inside tech. And that I think that I was very um coming from outside this world, I felt very sort of vulnerable when I first started screening my film to uh very Technic, technologically advanced communities, you know, Stanford <laughs> AI and 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 sort of the 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 big tech companies. But most of the major tech companies have hosted a, a screening of the film and have engaged on some level in critical conversation around the film, which I think is amazing. So um, I'm very proud that that has happened. And also, most importantly, one of the things that I'm proud of is that. Um, it sparked a conversation. I have literally had hundreds of conversations about artificial intelligence, um, almost exclusively helmed and led by women, people of color, women of color, LGBTQ. And it's my belief that that is um, unleashing a new kind of genius into the conversation and unleashing a new kind of imagination. It's um, my belief that we've had a stunning lack of imagination about how these technologies can be used because it's been dominated in the hands of a few companies who are only using it to market to us. We don't actually know what AI for good looks like or what the model for that could look like. And enough of us haven't been invited to the table to have that conversation. And so I hope that Coded Bias is that invitation that we all have a place at the a table um, to talk about these issues and, and, and how these, these systems are governed. For sure. And I think, yeah, I, I honestly, I, I think it's doing really, really important work in terms of letting us understand the effects of these things. So there's another question here um, from an audience member. In addition to looking into advocacy groups as on the Coded Bias website, what else would you suggest that individuals can do to help address this issue with algorithms? I know that this needs to be addressed on a systemic level, but is there also more that we can be, we should be doing in our own lives? On an individual level, what could we all be doing? Uh, moving to a farm. <laughs> Uh, off grid with no phones. I mean, it's just impossible to opt out. I mean, it's really hard. And I wish there were some tape over the camera, magic privacy settings, and we can all definitely be more vigilant about our privacy settings. Um, but the truth is the best way I know to do this is to actually support an organization um, that represents our values and is pushing for systematic change. For sure. Um, my colleague Jane just mentioned saying um, it would be great to let people know that Canada is actually engaged in related policy discussions. Uh, for example, Bill C-11 um, for privacy content moderation. Perhaps people can let their MPs know about their concerns as well. So that's another way to kind of engage with some of this. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. Um, and I think we have five minutes left. So I'm going to ask you, are you hopeful? Are you a cynic? Are you an optimist? How do you how do you feel about this? Do you think this can be a, that that we're going to be okay? I I think that no algorithm um, nor I can predict the future. That's a script we're all writing together, and that's I think that even with COVID, there's been this. I, I you want someone to tell you the future? <laughs> Are we going to be okay? And I think the truth is is that. Um, the future is made by the small decisions we each make every day. And um, those little actions, whether you choose to take five minutes at the end of this to go do something or sign up for something or, um, you know, give five dollars or whatever it is, um, 
I, I really believe that this is a script we're all writing together. I think that we have a moonshot moment to call for ethics in technology that um, I've seen sea change that I never thought possible. And it is a sign that big tech responds to people power coupled with informed science unencumbered by corporate interest. And so it's up to us to sort of um, give them heat to act ethically and, um, and to um, make sure that um, as, as we, we spend more of our times on these platforms that they represent our democratic ideals and values. Um, thank you so much, Shalini, for sharing your time with us and your thoughts with us. This was an amazing conversation. I'm so happy that we got to have it. And I hope that we get to chat some more because we obviously have overlapping interests. And um, I'm looking forward to your science fiction. <laughs> um, I'm going to um, hand, hand it back to Florian now um, to kind of close us out. And I want to say again, Shalini, it was a pleasure speaking with you and meeting you. And I've been looking forward to this so much. And I look forward to connecting with you in other ways um, in the future. Thank you so very much. It was an honor. Thanks so much. Yeah, my turn to say thank you to <laughs> both of you. It was a fascinating and amazing conversation. And as Jane uh, said, like, Sava, I think you are like the perfect person to be uh, in conversation with our guest uh, p speaker uh, today. And I will like emphasize you know, the point by Jane, my colleague Jane Bailey uh, did in the chat. You know, often as academic, when we come to parliament, to the government, you know, mentioning this kind of issue, saying that we need to develop legal framework to protect citizens, they look at us like, you're crazy. This is sci-fi. No, this is not. This is happening. So yeah, please let know your uh, MPs, <laughs> your colleagues that we need to uh, beef up a bit our privacy. Make them watch this movie, right? Make them yes. watch uh, every, that should be mandatory, you know, in the House of Commons. For and just sure. To look at that movie. So again, congratulations, uh, Shalini Kendaya, for that amazing movie. So so important conversation. And thank you again, Sava, for being uh, the facilitator for today's event and for everybody in attendance. We had an amazing uh, turnout. And uh, so without further ado, uh, we will end it over uh, here. I will also invite you to go check on our, our website, aisociety.ca. We have many other events coming up uh, in the in the coming weeks to continue that that conversation. So again, thank you so much. Uh, passez une belle fin de journée et au plaisir de vous revoir bientôt à l'un de nos événements. Bye bye. <laughs>